Hey guys, it's JT Tran again here with the ABCs of Attraction and today I have a very special guest. With me is Simon Tam. You might recognize him as the figurative and literal rock star. You're the basis for the slants, right? Yeah. A rock band as well as a TED speaker and he's involved in a sort of famous or dare I say infamous uh, trademark battle that has to do with uh, a racial epitaph or actually taking back ownership of a racial epitaph, right? That's right. Um, why don't you tell our audience a little bit about you, Simon? Sure. Uh, so I was born and raised in San Diego um, with the dream of, I've always wanted to do arts and or activism. Like, I mean, from a, before I could even talk, I would grab my dad's guitar, jump on the coffee table in the family living room and start playing a show for the family. They didn't make you do violin or piano like all the other Asian parents. No, well, they, they didn't really know what to do. They, they wanted to put, put me in piano lessons, but I wanted to rock out. I wanted to play guitar or bass guitar. And around that same time period, when I wasn't trying to play bass, um, I would actually beg my parents for money and ask them to give, them, give me change so I could give it to the homeless that I saw in the intersection of the street. So there's a part of me that I always wanted to do something to help those who were hurting or marginalized. Yeah. And then there's a part of me who always wanted to share music on stage. And I didn't realize until just a couple of years ago how I could really combine the two. My love for uh, helping others along with creating art. Well, the thing is, your pursuit of art has given you a platform that otherwise most normal civilians wouldn't have. When you pursue something creatively and passionately, you have this larger audience, right? Because you're in this rock band and it's, it's gaining a following. and you've been able to parlay that into something that you think is worthwhile. So <clears throat> before we get into that, right, the very, you know, kind of political side, let's talk about the fact that you pursued your art and your music uh, in a very non-traditional Asian path. And, you know, everyone here at the ABC's Attraction channel, I definitely encourage everyone to follow your passions, not simply, you know, getting your good grades and a college degree and being an IT or engineer or a doctor or a lawyer, but actually following something that you're passionate about. And you did that. You actually did something that was kind of, would be considered crazy in Asian circles, traditional Asian circles. Yeah. Um, so a couple months from graduating on a full ride scholarship with a, a double major at, at UC Riverside, I was asked to join. What was your double major? Uh, philosophy and religious studies, actually. Oh, okay, that's pretty non tradition to so, begin with. <laughs> yeah, I wanted to think and, um, and, and do, go into diplomacy and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, but, or think about being broke with those degrees. <laughs> but I was offered a position to play bass for a touring punk rock band. So I decided that sounds like a great idea. I dropped out of college, moved across the country, and joined this band. And a lot of people thought I was crazy. What did your parents think? At the time, they were surprisingly supportive. Really? Yeah, they knew how unhappy I was. I was just ah, miserable okay. in that time period. You're, you're miserable being, being like a, a square. Yeah, and, and they just they, they realized I needed a change. So I, uh, so I did it. I moved across the country. And especially when people learned that the band only lasted about a year and a half after I moved, they they're like, that was really stupid. But the reality is just the very act of preparing for that moment and learning how to take risks and really figuring out who I wanted to be. It unlocked a new kind of potential within me, a new desire that allowed me to start the slants, my, my current group, which I was able to just travel the world and, and, yeah. and experience. You became more self-aware of your own desires, uh, what your passion was. Definitely. And it really allowed me to question my values. I think we really figure out who we are in those moments where we force ourselves to confront our doubts and insecurities. Mm -hmm. I think it's really important for everyone to, like I said, don't simply follow a traditional path because that's what people tell you because if you're doing what everyone else is doing, what kind of results are you going to get in life? You're going to get what everyone else, you know, their results, right? You're going to just be a generic person. Uh, but if our audience here, you know, some young and some, you know, young male or female wants to be a rock star, how do you go about, uh, go about becoming a, a musician, a, an actual working musician? Well, uh, like I said, it, it's following a non-traditional path. So mm -hmm. that means breaking away from what every other musician is doing, which is, um, I mean, the music is definitely important. Learn your craft, learn your art. but at the same time realize it's also a business. Mm. And so um, 
like learn the business part of it, learn other skills that you'll need. So like, I think a lot of Asians would be good at that part. Yeah, like it's not just playing guitar on stage. If you, if you know how to do video editing, you're, you can create videos that you upload yeah. on YouTube. If you know how to do marketing, you can create like a social media scheme or marketing plan that, that can get you better results. So like acquire these other skills and fold them into your art because that's what allows you to be more successful and puts you um, kind of on the top edge because most musicians are terrible at business. They might be the best you know, musician in the world, but if you're only playing in your garage, you are not being successful. But if you know how to market yourself, create a brand, uh, logistically handle booking a tour, that sort of thing, then all of a sudden you have a new skill set that you can apply um, not only to your music career, but uh, anything else that you want to pursue. I mean, okay. For me, I, I took everything I know about marketing comes from being a rock star, <laughs> touring, and, and I took those same concepts and I applied it to, to books. And so I, I published two books just thinking, how would I approach this if it were an album or, or forgetting TED Talks or anything else? It was like, well, if I was thinking about this as a gig, what would I do? Okay. And so I just applied the same concepts, preparing myself, learning how to sell who I am and or my message and my art and uh, and that's what allowed me to be successful in ways where, where everyone else is kind of stuck on this traditional path like oh well, to get a book you have to get a book agent and I was like no you don't you can make your own book or uh, people are like oh you have to apply a TED website I'm like well if everyone else is applying how are you going to get through the how are you going right. to so I just created my own path well you know what I, I think you know, the analogy or example being like how YouTube is sort of the Asian do-it-yourself Hollywood. Yeah. Because there's so many kind of gatekeepers to entertainment media success. That old like, you know, white boys old, you know, club where you have to as an Asian person or any just kind of person of, of not like substantial means or, or connections, you have to be innovative. You have to take a non-traditional route to success. Um, so, you know, I'm not a rock star. I'm, I'm kind of internet famous, but only amongst men. So I get recognized almost every night that I go out. What is it like to be an actual rock star? You go up on stage like every night. How is that feeling? Um, being on stage is, is incredible. I mean, I, yeah. I love it. It's, it's my art. But I think that- Yeah, also, fans, or, or like adoring women and groupies. It's, it's <laughs> you know, there's, there's definitely a glamorous side to it. Sure, it's sure. a lot of fun. But there's also a, the side where it's like any other job, whether you're a plumber or a garbage man or a retail worker, like you just gotta show up and do the job. Yeah, you gotta hustle. Yeah, so for me, like I, you know, like uh, two nights ago, we, we got hit by a snowstorm, we had to cancel the show. So we're like, okay, what do we do? Well, we drove 18 hours straight to, to Las Vegas. And then I was like, well, oh, it's Thanksgiving, Night, we're in Vegas, <laughs> so our show doesn't even start till one in the morning. And afterwards, I was like, we just drove all night the night before. Let's just drive all night again, so we go to San Diego and sleep for a little bit. Okay. And so it's just like doing this over and over again. Um, but but I love it. It's it's, cool. it's a lot of fun. Now, do you feel that being on stage and having this platform, and we'll go into how you use that platform in other areas. I'm just curious because so I get like so many readers and commenters saying that they feel disadvantaged as being an Asian guy here. Like you're on stage, you own the crowd. Everybody looks up to you. Do you feel that that gives you something, a perspective or confidence that maybe other Asians don't experience? That's a, that's a good question. I mean, I, I think the, the confidence definitely comes from being very secure about the, the art and what we do. Um, and we were very deliberate about this process. Because when I was starting an all Asian band, I knew I wanted to confront stereotypes. And one of those ma major stereotypes about Asians is that we're quiet and we're reserved. Mm -hmm. So when we put on shows, we aren't quiet <laughs> or reserved. We're like, it's this bombastic, energetic experience okay. where we'll breathe fire, we'll jump on boxes. I respect we'll that. Hours. And we're like, we want to tear down these stereotypes and show that we can rock out harder than anybody else. And um, because we've been doing it over and over again, it's given us a really good uh, aura of self-confidence and, and really helped us um, develop our stage presence and, and our craft to where it needed to be. Okay. And with this stage presence and this platform, you've parlayed it into a, a TED uh, career, uh, speaking for TED, as well as a trademark battle because your band's name is The Slants, mm -hmm. right? And that, you know, that has 
some social and political ramifications. You want to talk about uh, your TAD and your political kind of case, legal case battle? Sure. Um, well, the, the TED Talks actually initially came from from the controversy. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's what. So, we'll explain to the, to the audience what the controversy and is. Yeah. So, the controversy is that, at, like in 2009, my attorney recommended we file an application for a trademark on, on our band's name. And so, we thought, great. He said it'd be yeah. simple, easy to do, inexpensive. We filled out the application, sent it in. A couple months later, a trademark office contacts us and they gave us a rejection letter. They said that the name the slants or slant itself is a racial slur and so therefore we would not be able to register the trademark uh, we we fought this thing because we're like we're all asian we play asian american festivals we do anti-racism work sometimes on behalf of the government and it who is this random white guy in this decision so, so we had uh, thousands of pages of evidence we had uh, one of the editors at the new american oxford dictionary wrote a 70 page analysis of the word slant. We had national surveys, we had internment camp survivors, uh, nearly every Asian American. You brought your A game here. Yeah, and, and, this is, and this is against what the trademark office brought, which was a quote from urbandictionary.com, <laughs> uh, a photo of Miley Cyrus pulling her eyes back in a slant, a gesture, and then a couple of you know excerpts from dictionaries from the 1930s. So they clearly, it was awful, like stuff that wouldn't right. be acceptable in a junior high classroom, but was being used in a federal court of law against us. Um, they continued to deny it. And finally, we said, well, hold on a second. You've approved almost 800 trademark applications for slant. Why is this one the only one in the entire history of the country to be denied because you, you claim it's racist towards Asians? If it, if it really is a race or slur, why didn't you deny all these other applications? They said it's because you're Asian. Not only are you Irish, Asian, they said we're too Asian. Too Asian. Yeah. I guess it's possible to be too Asian. <laughs> yeah, it's because in their mind, if someone goes on the slants.com, they see photos of Asians on the website, they'll automatically think of a racial slur and not any other definition. So it would have been okay if it was like a white band? Yes. Uh, basically what they're saying is anyone can trademark the slants as long as they're not. Asian in our case. Oh, geez. There was that one video. It was uh, some punk rock. I, I forget exactly who. It was like this big controversy. And oh, I forget. I don't know if you remember. I was a complete uh, tangent. But it was like something about Asian women or something. Do you know? Oh, uh, the, yeah, there was like a metal band talking about. Yeah. Uh, looking up with Asian women. Something like that. I forget. And like the model ended up like. You know, coming back and saying she didn't realize it was going to be that racist. Yeah. So you're telling me like a band like that could get trademarked if they were called the Slants and they were actually making videos that were, you know, offensive to Asians. That'd be okay. Theoretically, I mean, well, like the KKK has trademarks. So really? Supremacist groups. Um, so it, it's but so we, we can't take ownership back. And right. for those of our audience, so like a lot of people that are watching this aren't necessarily aware of on the political side of, of social activism. There's this idea that you can take a word and, and t take the power away from it and own it. Sure. Kind of like how African Americans have, you know, taken some control over the N word. Here, you know, the idea is that you're taking what is a term that I used to be called like when I was a kid, sure. you know, slant, gook and all that, and you're trying to make it your own, make it so that we as Asians can own it and not be offended because we have it now. Right. But the government says, we we can't have it. It's white people it's don't white make people making the decision. So um, oh. we've been fighting five and a half years. Just wow. out of Washington D.C. Uh, two months ago, and uh, most people believe we're going to be going to the Supreme Court over this issue. Wow! So, but if we win, then all of a sudden the government doesn't have a right to um, censor based on content. In other words, they can't say, "Well, we like what you have to say. We don't like what they have to say." Huh. All of a sudden, you know, trademark law. It shouldn't involve morality. We shouldn't allow these random white guys in the trademark office to make all the decision for every community of color. Uh, it just It's not practical. They don't have the experience, knowledge, or awareness to do so. Wow. You know what? This is one of the things why I respect you so much. Not only are you that creative side of being uh, you know, a musician, a rock star, you are one of the few Asian Americans I know that are making an impact or attempting in real life an impact 
on, on changing society. Because I know so many Asian Americans, they are like Twitter activists, right? And they're like, oh, I'm gonna write something and I'm gonna be angry at the white man. And it's just in this internet ethosphere where there's absolutely no effect other than this kind of like echo chamber of your own internal mind. Here you're making a real difference in real life which is something like I doing what I do, dating coaching, you know, trying to change real people so that they can make effect in real life. So Supreme Court man, that's pretty, that sounds pretty big. Um, yeah, well, I'm really hoping the legal fees won't be that big. <laughs> oh. uh, but I'm thinking we can probably get support for it because there's yeah. a lot of people, I mean, they've been using this law for 70 years to disproportionately affect uh, people of color. Mm -hmm. And so we're like, it's about time to get rid of this law. It's, it's ineffective and it doesn't even make sense when you consider how they dish out copyrights to anything. Right. Um, you know, it could be pornographic films, it could be books with uh, swear words or uh, anything that the government might, con government might consider offensive, they get all the copyright protection possible. Uh, same thing with patents. You can patent machines that kill or do other things, but trademark law is the only loophole in the entire government huh. where they're like, mm, we don't really like that, so we're going to say no to that. Okay. Interesting. All right. And you've used this this notoriety, your, your, your attempt that was at first to simply take ownership of a word and you know that was the original attempt. It wasn't to make any kind of other career out of it. Because <laughs> <No. laughs> who wants to do that? Yeah, nobody's like, I'm going to start a band and go to court. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And because of that notoriety, you became a TED speaker. How did that come about? Like, what was your topic? And you wrote books. Yeah. Right. Um, well, the, the TED thing was like, I mean, I watched all the TED videos. Mm -hmm. like, TED's this great. Is awesome. Really inspiring. Why, are, why is everyone on the TED stage like a straight white male? Like, why can't we shake things up a little bit? Um, I went on the TED website, and there's this application you can nominate mm -hmm. someone. I was like, okay, I'll go through that. And then I thought, wait, there's these independent TEDx events all over the country. How do I get into that instead? So I went on the TED website, clicked on events, and then I contacted every single event in the world where I could wow. communicate in the language or, and I had an idea that fit their theme. Uh, so I started out with like about 300 or so. And one of them- That's finally, a muscle. Yeah, one of them finally said yes, because I was like, this is who I am, this is my idea. I just kept doing that over and over again. One, one day someone said yes, um, TEDx U of Dub, uh, and that was my first one. And then so as soon as they said, yes, we'll invite you, I went back to all the other 299. I was like, hey, by the way, I got my first one. Um, let's do this. And I got two more from just from following up and saying, mm -hmm. like, someone's giving Persistence. Me yeah. And then I just did that over and over again. And so uh, two weeks ago, I spoke at my, my seventh TEDx event. Nice. Wow. And the, the topic is about your trademark battle or you've been branching out? I mean, they're, they're different each time. Okay. So a lot of it has to do with arts or activism mm -hmm. um, or identity politics. So, uh, but I actually, one of my TED Talks is actually called How to Get a TED Talk. <laughs> really like, and it was about the same thing. It's, it's about persistence. It's learning yeah. how to make an ask. And my, my, uh, my pitch there was like, whether you want to get a TED Talk, you want to get a date for Saturday night, you want to uh, get a sponsorship for your band, it all comes down to and making an ask. Like, nothing happens until you ask. Yeah, it's like what Rain Goretzky said, you miss 100% of the shots that you don't take. Exactly. You, know, like you, you have to try, and even if you fail, you continue to, to try again and persist. And but you, you don't simply fail. take the first no as like the final answer, yeah, right? If you fail, that's, that's a learning experience. Yeah. Now, Isabel called it like every rejection is a step closer to, su to success. Definitely. Cool. And the, what are the names of your books? Uh, so the first one was how to get sponsorships and endorsements. Okay. And it, it's basically a book for artists or nonprofits to get funding. Right. Uh, the other one is called Music Business Hacks, and it's about uh, music business entrepreneurship. Okay. So for our audience here that are looking into the business of music, yeah, right? This is definitely something to check out Simon Tam's uh, Amazon books. They're on Amazon, right? And like yeah. everywhere. Okay, cool. Yeah. Um, so this has been really fascinating. I appreciate the fact that you are a triple threat, so to speak. You're the Asian rock star in both like the literal sense, the fact that you're in your own rock band, punk rock band, and the figurative sense because you're pursuing a social uh, kind of social activism route to change our, our world or our, our society because I always tell our audience that if we don't see the positive 
role models, if we don't see the positive change, then we need to become that. We can't let someone else just wait and hope that they do something for us, right? Definitely. Yeah, I mean, man, when I started doing the slants, like 2004 was when I had the idea, there's nobody out there. Mm -hmm. Like there was, I couldn't, I was like thinking, where can I, could I think of a single Asian American male lead in romantic comedy? I was like, right. couldn't I think of one? And then I started thinking about bands and I'm like the rock scene, like who, who dominates billboard charts? Who dominates the radio and MTV and everything else? And I was like, nobody else is there. So we just got to go up there and, and, and do it and show that it is possible. Great, great. Um, any last words for our audience, Simon? Uh, I, I mean, I just think no matter what, people should really learn how to pursue what they're most passionate mm -hmm. about. You know, we always talk about this idea of like, what is the cost of following the dream? Like, what do you have to give up to get something? Uh, but I always think that the true cost of following your dreams is what happens to you when you don't follow them. Right. When you suppress those passions and those dreams that you have, I think it makes you bitter and unhappy. I know. I, I teach a lot of guys that they never smell the roses. Yeah. You know, and here I'm teaching them in their thirties and they're like, man, I, <laughs> you don't die wishing that you worked more for the man, right? <laughs> no, but definitely when you, when you chase after those dreams, it really unlocks a new element of who you are. It builds confidence, gives you passion, ultimately makes you happier, which right. I think is what attracts other people. Um, it becomes like you're this magnet of positive energy and, and it, it brings a lot more success and good things to you when you're doing the things you love instead of just following the path created by other people. Cool, cool. And how can our audience find more about you, Simon, uh, your, your website, your, your rock band, and your books? Well, uh, my, my personal website is simontam.org and if you're interested in some like 80s inspired, uh, what we call Chinatown dance rock, <laughs> go to theslants.com. Cool, cool. And check out uh, his books. His information will be down in the YouTube description. So click on those links, guys. All right. Thank you so much, Simon. Thank you. Bye. Hey there. Thanks for watching our video. I hope you liked it. And make sure you guys subscribe to this channel and watch all our other videos. Great news, too. Every Monday, we'll be putting out a new weekly video. That's right, we've got educational seminars, street interviews, uh, fun infield pickup videos, and anything else we can come up with that's fun for you guys to watch. So check back for that every Monday. Oh, and if that's not enough for you, remember that for the last 10 years, the ABCs of Attraction have been the finishing school for Asian gentlemen. So we've been teaching guys how to be better boyfriends, more confident, and better husbands. If you need that extra push, you can enroll in one of our classes. But until then, we'll see you every Monday. Bye.